Welcome back. Today's model covers auto differentiation. This is one of the first modules that will bring us beyond the foundational structure of machine learning to some of the core components of deep learning. If you recall, last lecture, we focused on symbolic derivatives. We were interested in the standard high school calculus definitions of how we transform a function f of x to a function f prime of x. We did this by applying the standard rules of calculus and applying the chain rule. In addition, we also looked at the standard formula for central difference. This gives us a way to approximate the derivative by calculating two calls to the function, one at fx plus epsilon and one at fx minus epsilon. This seems like a minor cost, but we'll see that this really adds up when working with more complex functions. We also talked about the idea of a derivative as a higher order function. It can be thought of with the type signature given below. We can think of derivative as a function from an input function f to an output function f prime. It's our goal to define this f prime in order to return a derivative value. This will be a useful way of thinking about a derivative for doing our testing and just for thinking about this mathematically. In today's class, we're gonna focus on auto differentiation. We'll define what this means, compare how it looks when compared to numerical or symbolic differentiation, and talk about the construction of a computational graph. This will lead into the definition of backwards, and in next class, we'll get deeper into the idea of backpropagation. So let's start by talking about auto differentiation. A standard question that I get at this point in the class is how do these methods differ? Recall that for symbolic differentiation, we were actually trying to get out the true mathematical form. This would allow us to have a mathematical version of f prime that we could call for any input x. Recall also that for numerical differentiation, we didn't assume anything about the function we were given, but we had to call this black box function multiple times. Auto differentiation is going to give us a method that falls somewhere in between these two. We're not gonna be able to obtain the true mathematical form, but we're also not going to have to assume that the original function is completely black box. So let's talk a little bit high level about auto differentiation. There will be two parts to this. One is called the forward pass. This is where we will trace an arbitrary function that represents f. Then we'll run the backwards pass. This will give us a way to compute f prime for the same x that we used in the forward pass. Let's start by talking about this forward pass. The way it works in practice is that the user writes mathematical code. We basically spy on what they are doing and pull out a computational graph that expresses every operation that was run. This computational graph will then form the basis for our backwards pass. On the backwards pass, we then utilize this graph to actually compute the derivative. We'll use R and shear to represent the progress on the backward pass, resulting in derivatives of this implied function for its two arguments, x and y. To make this more tangible and connect it to our machine learning model, the model we've been looking at is called m, and it's a linear model. The function m is defined as taking the input x, as well as parameters w1, w2, and b. We then utilize m to compute our loss function, which is defined as taking a ReLU of the output of m. This is a simplistic loss function for a single input value, but it still represents a complex function that we need to take a derivative for. Given this goal, our forward pass is going to compute the loss function L, and our backward pass will assist us for computing three derivatives, L prime with respect to W1, L prime with respect to W2, and L prime with respect to the bias B. If we have these three derivatives, we are able to use them to update our loss function and fit our machine learning model. We'll come back to this in more detail in a couple lectures. For now, I just want to motivate the fact that we need to compute derivatives efficiently. The other thing I'll note at this point is that all three of the derivatives we've defined so far, symbolic, numeric, and auto differentiation, should return the same values. Since all these three should roughly match, this gives us a really nice way to write test functions for our implementation. We'll be able to experiment with different ways of utilizing autodiff and be sure that all of them return the same value. Our strategy for implementing auto differentiation will be kind of interesting, actually. To make this work within Python, we're going to replace the generic numbers that Python uses with a special class. 
we'll call this class scalar. We'll also replace all mathematical functions with special versions of these functions, which we'll call scalar functions, and we'll track how these are applied. When we finish doing this correctly, we'll find that the user basically can't tell we've done anything at all, but we'll have enough information to compute both the forward and the backward pass. The main way we'll do this is by constructing a computation graph. The strategy for doing this is to define a new class that will act like a numerical value to the user. But behind the scenes for this new variable, we can basically trace the operations that are applied and hide the fact that we're doing this from the user. Let's look at this for a couple example functions. The first scalar function we'll define is ReLU. Here we want to just apply ReLU to an input x and produce out an input fx. We can also do this for multi-function functions. So for a function like multiply, we take in x and y and return out fx comma y, which is equal to x times y. Once we have these two boxes, we can compose them together. And we'll use arrows within a box diagram to represent the intermediate values. So here, if we define f as ReLU and g as log, we can compose the two functions together. This is shown at the bottom of the slide. The input arrow is x, the middle value is g of x, and the final value is f of g of x, that is ReLU of log of x. To implement this, we will define scalar functions, which represent the boxes, as a static class. This static class will need to implement two methods, which we'll call forward and backward. The user will never end up calling these forward or backward methods. Instead, they will call a third method called apply, which handles construction of the computational graph, as well as calling the correct functions of the scalar function. To make this more tangible, assume we want to add a new function to our library. It's called x times 5. We're going to define it as a new box in this library that takes in an input and produces that input times 5. We will define it in Minitorch by defining a new class. This will be a static class, so it will only have static method. It will inherit from scalar function, and its first static method is just called forward. Forward basically maps from a float to a float and returns the mathematical version that we described above. It will also take an additional argument called context, which we'll describe in future slides. Another box is the mole function that we saw earlier. Mole also inherits from scalar function, and its static forward method takes in x and y, both of which are floats, and returns a float value. It does this by simply multiplying x and y together. We draw it as a box with two in arrows and one out arrow. Additionally, I mentioned that to make this work, we're going to need to wrap the numerical values in a special form. This will allow us to keep track of their history and eventually run the backward pass. We define this in Minitorch with a class scalar that wraps the float value that's passed in. So x1 and x2 here represent scalar values. In order to use these scalar values, there's a static method, apply. Apply is on all scalar functions. It takes in a scalar, runs forward, and then outputs a scalar. In order for this to work, this method needs to unwrap the scalar value to pull out the float inside of it, run the scalar functions forward, and then rewrap this again. We'll see that the purpose of this is to allow us to both run the forward method and also keep track of the history of which scalar functions have been applied to each scalar value. This gets a bit more complex when there are multiple steps and multiple different values. Here we define x and y as scalar values and then transform x by first applying times 5 to produce a new scalar value z and then applying times 5 again to produce our output scalar. There are some tricks to make this easier for a user to use in practice. The main trick that we'll be using is aggressive use of operator overloading to ensure that the user doesn't really realize that they are using scalar functions and can use notation that is more familiar to them. So instead of actually calling mole.apply, we will instead operator overload scalar such that standard multiplication will behind the scenes 
call mole.apply in order to make this process work. So in the example before, we could have multiplied x and y together, which would have produced a new scalar out too. This is done by just calling apply behind the scenes. We'll see that many of the different functions internally are implemented in this way. The other important thing to note is that every call to a scalar function effectively creates a new scalar variable. Therefore, there are no loops in this graph. We don't have the ability to modify a scalar, so the graph only gets larger over time. Now that we have this graph, let's look at how we implement backwards. The key idea for backwards is that each one of these boxes will compute the derivative of a single function. For the base case, we'll just compute this derivative by looking up the standard derivative rules. The power of backwards is it will give us an inductive case, which will allow us to combine multiple of these boxes in order to propagate a derivative from the right-hand side to the left-hand side, or the backwards direction. As the library designers, we need to code up for each f box its derivative f prime. This part can be done through manual symbolic differentiation. That's a fancy way of saying just writing down the derivative for each box. The backward method uses the following API. For each backward, we need to implement f prime. Once we do that, we need to compute this value f prime of x times d, which is a value passed to us in the backward method. We'll focus on d in the next lecture. So for now, just note you have to return f prime applied to x times d. So as an example, for our times 5 class, the static forward method computed x times 5. The backward method needs to return f prime times d. In this case, f prime is just the value 5, so we return 5 times d. For two arg functions, backward needs to return two different values. The first is f prime with respect to x, the first argument, times d. And the second is f prime with respect to y, the second argument, times d. Note in particular that both of these use the same d in their multiplication. Here's an example for a two argument function. f of x comma y is equal to x plus two times y. f prime with respect to x is simply one. So for that, we return one times d. f prime with respect to y is two. So we return two times d. We end up returning a tuple of two float values. Next, we have to consider the point of context. Note that context is passed both to the forward and backwards method. And we have flexibility in how we use context to implement our derivatives. Specifically, context is used to help us with derivative functions that use the values themselves. So, so far I've been careful to only take the derivatives of functions that ended up having a constant derivative. But what about a function like g of x equals x squared? The derivative here is g prime x equals two times x. However, if we look at the arguments to the backward method, we can see that it only takes in the context and this d value. So we need to keep track of the x value somehow so we can pass it to g prime. More explicitly, if we want to define square, we need to use context to save for backwards the x value in the forward pass. We can then extract this saved value in the backwards pass to get the value we need to compute x at. This gives us f prime is equal to 2 times x, which is the derivative of x squared. We then multiply this by d out. So to summarize, we now have a method for defining both the forward and the backwards pass for arbitrary functions. These work by taking in a scalar value, unwrapping this to a float value, applying the forward pass to get the computation of the function itself, which then gets rewrapped into a scalar value. The backwards method will allow us a way to actually compute the derivative f prime of this function as well as arbitrary functions that are composed by writing multiple of these scalar functions together. Next class, we're going to focus on the backward pass to see how this actually works in practice.
but I want to end by showing you a little bit of the internals of this scalar class. So in particular, in addition to keeping the actual value itself, the scalar class is going to keep around the history of all the scalar functions that have been applied. If we look at x2.history, we'll see that it contains three important pieces of information. It contains the last scalar function that was applied. It contains the context that was used for this scalar function. Specifically, it saves the saved value that it's going to need for the backwards pass. In addition, it keeps around the scalar inputs to this function. And these are scalar classes themselves, which contain the information for the previous functions in the graph. So in practice, what this means is we are not going to need to keep the graph separately. We already have this graph. It is implicitly uh, defined by each of these scalar objects in the mathematical equation itself. Okay, so we'll end there. As always, feel free to ask any questions in the comments, and next class we'll dive into the details of backpropagation.